stuff up. Well, let's do it. Welcome to the October 10th meeting of the ZAC committee. Um, we seem to be missing a few members. Rhea will not be able to join us tonight. Um, but, oh, yes, we were going to wave at her. <coughs> Rhea might be watching us on TV. <laughs> um, and I'm, I haven't heard from anybody else that they couldn't make it, so I'm hoping they will show up. Um, and I know Matu um, prepared some material to discuss as well. So, <coughs> <coughs> But let's go ahead and start with the solar overlay district and the information that you gathered um, in July, Ted, July and August. I think I said in the spring in an email and I was wrong. It just felt like in the spring. Yeah. Um, so did you not discuss it all last week? It was just tabled until I could show it? Um, yes, we did not discuss this last week. <coughs> so, um, so again, the background was this. Sometime last year, um, knowing that we've had solar farms move to town, knowing that the <coughs> have been impacted pretty heavily by the solar farms, um, but also knowing that the state um, wants to encourage solar. I want to encourage solar. I like the idea of renewable energy a lot. But having driven through some of the neighborhoods where these solar farms were put in, I also have huge sympathy for them, and I hope that doesn't happen in my neighborhood. So I wanted to see if there were some ways that we could um, have a little more control, we the town, uh, over where solar farms go. Um, and the message I got was there's not much you can do because the state so much wants solar farms that you can't, you can't change buffers, you can't do all sorts of stuff. Um, what I found uh, initially was that Wellesley had created a, um, I don't think they call it a solar overlay, but an overlay. And so I thought to myself, hmm, that's interesting, let me see what I can learn. Um, and I didn't learn much online. And then I found that Weston had done the same. Um, I didn't look for any other towns. Um, my homework was to see if I could learn more about Wellesley and Weston. Um, it was a while ago. I pulled up the document that I sent to you guys in front of me. What struck me most when I talked to the town officials in those towns is how easy it seemed for them to make these solar farms, how zero pushback, or overlay districts, how little pushback they got, and how surprised they were that I was surprised that they got no pushback. They said, no. We just made a district, and we invited solar farms to that district, and no, nobody ever said anything. I said, has anyone recently, as solar gets more popular, <clears throat> pushed back on your bylaws? And they said, no, we have heard nothing. Um, in Wellesley, the, the woman I spoke with was the interim planning director, and she said, truthfully, I wasn't around when it was passed. I only knew so much. Um, what interested me most about Wellesley is the only place they allow, although their wording is they encourage solar farms, solar panels, is in the um, jug handle of the interchange between Route 9 and Route 495. Um, it's not very much space at all. I don't necessarily believe that my goal is to make it so that we make that little available space. But what struck me is, I don't know who owns that land. I assume the state owns it because it's state highways. Um, the reason that interests me is because we have a whole lot of highway going through our town with a whole lot of median space, and if we could tap into that space as inviting solar, um, I don't think any neighborhoods would be affected at all. I think um, it would encourage <coughs> solar, solar renewable energy uh, development, and I'm for that as long as we're not hurting neighborhoods. So I asked about that, and she said, I don't know who owns that. I, I don't know anything about that. So I left it at that. In Weston, they had, um, uh, as near as I could tell, it was essentially a dump um, that they wanted to redo. It runs along the bike trail that they had fought for some years. But now the bike trail is there and paved. And right in there is where they created their uh, renewable energy overlay district. Um, after a year or two, a company found it and moved in, and they said they've had a great relationship with that company, and it's worked out wonderfully, and it's not impacting neighborhoods. Um, what uh, Wellesley said is there, I, I just remembered this looking at my notes, uh, part of the reason they created that district is they were trying to become a, um, 
what's the official term? A green community, what's the official? The DORE? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that was an effort in that direction. So the woman encouraged me, she said, well, you know, make it part of an effort to become a green community. And then I found out we already are a green community. Um, I don't know if that makes it easier to make an overlay or harder because we don't have an end goal that we're trying to achieve. But both of them are green communities and both of them said this fit in their planning with being green communities. So that's what I learned. Um, again, I don't know if any other towns have done anything. I don't know what we can draw from that. I've um, seen something in Westboro. Um, when you go to the Westboro station on the way yes. uh, from 135, yep. that's bang in the middle of a neighborhood. It's a very narrow street, one lane, homes on either side, and then just before you turn right to get to Westboro Station on the right side, uh, it's a couple of parcels of land. In fact, one of them is bisected by another road itself. So back to your point about Westboro doesn't have, I, I, maybe there is other stuff on the highway, but there is overlay or a district right in the middle of a residential neighborhood. Mm. Westboro actually has a couple. Um, I can actually speak to that okay. if you'd like as a Westboro resident. So that one that's on uh, Fisher Street, yes. I believe, that was the, basically built before they had a solar bylaw. So that's why it's got that green screen on the fence because they basically had no restrictions on solar farms at that point. So that company just came in and located right there, right up to the street. And it was kind of a concession knowing that they got away with it to put that barrier up. Okay. Um, and then there was arguments that the reflection, since it's right at street level, might affect some of the cars on that road. Um, the other other solar arrays are if you're going up, um, not on Otis Street. So if you go up Milk Street, there's one, and you know where Cold Harbor is on the left. Yes. If you look over to the right, there's like a um, I think it's a U-Haul place or something like that. But down, mm -hmm. uh, uh, lower, there's one there. And then if you're going on 495 mm -hmm. before you, I think it's before you get off exit 23B to get on mm -hmm. 9, there's that one that's north of Flanders. Um, yes. Yeah. And yes. that one, if you actually go on the road that uh, has the solar farm ad uh, adjacent to the houses, that's got, I think, got a stockade fence, so you really can't see it from the road. It's a pretty high stockade fence. Mm -hmm. I want to say there's another one, but I can't remember where it is. So that, that one that's right on Fisher Street is kind of... Sure. Okay. Not a good example. Not a great example okay. because, okay. yeah, that was done without any restrictions, okay. really. Okay. And do you know what the current zoning in Westboro it is? Okay. So that's what I learned. I don't know for sure what to do with that, but it seemed to me at least an invitation that maybe we shouldn't, if, if this is an idea that appeals to people, mm -hmm. the solar overlay, that there seems to be a route where this is, a possible thing that towns have done it and towns have not gotten pushback from developers or the state and it might be worth pursuing further so it seems to me that we could come up with some recommendations as to areas of town that might be appropriate for this but my suggestion is that we would take it in a pretty stepwise process where maybe maybe come up with some of these suggestions and then um, hold a public comment or something like that, you know, to get feedback on that. Um, there's also the property owners themselves in those areas, you know, that we might want to make sure we're involving in a process before we try to you know, send it on to town meeting as a done deal. Would it make more sense to have public comment in front of this body or the planning board? Probably in front of this body because we would be the ones drafting the, the language yeah. to send to the planning board. Planning board would still have a hearing on it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, when they made their decision. Well, I, I guess, and I'm not on the planning board. Um, I don't want to I fear doing too much work and then having the planning board say, that is a ridiculous idea for places for solar farms, and then we're back to square one. I wonder if there's a step-by-step -step process to say to the planning board, maybe this is something we're talking about. What are your initial thoughts? We could ask Mary to take yep. the planning board we'll before that. we spend a lot of time working on it. Could I ask a question on that? So you made a comment that Wellesley's person was surprised that he was surprised. Mm -hmm. But then you earlier professed that by saying that you felt that neighborhoods would be adversely impacted. 
there is definitely a conflict in those statements. Why would she neighborhoods be at risk? We were worried about pushback. Right, but what is your basis for assuming that pushback? Because that's what I'd heard in previous discussions in here and from other town officials that the state is so encouraging renewable energy development that it's very hard to establish restrictions that might protect neighborhoods. And so when I shared that news with Wellesley or Weston, they said, well, we, nobody's ever said anything to us. We okay. just did it. And nobody... But my recollection when we were looking at it originally was it could not be prohibitive and it could not be restrictive. We had to come up with a, with a set of rules that were reasonable. Okay. And to, based on that recollection, looking at Wellesley's time where they've got this one small spot that's saying, we'd love to have you, but you can only be here, that goes against mm. the directions that I recall getting. From the state. From the state when we wrote it. That's, I think, why I was surprised that, there was, that it was okay for them to do what they had done. Okay. So you've got to accommodate those solar companies rather than restrict them. I mean, if those are the two ends of the spectrum. Right. Okay. Do, do you think, um, I like the highway thing. I think that's a great use of, of space that's not being used. I don't know whether it causes any issues, whether the highway's running north-south or east-west with reflection and increases accidents or anything. And I wonder if maybe Carolyn Dykma might be a good place to start because she is on the transportation department. She also, part of my mailing, and, and honestly, I only know a little bit because someone sent it to me. She was um, talking to planning board member Gary Trendle because mm -hmm. Gary raised the issue of solar development in our town. And so I included in my email to you guys the letter that Carolyn wrote to, and I don't remember the state official's name, Judith. Saying it's time for us to reconsider our policies. Can we reconsider green space versus brown space for the developing soul? And so maybe stuff is happening above us that might help prevent some of the, in my opinion, uglier neighborhood impacting solar farms that have come into town. So there could be multiple levels working. And maybe Carolyn's good for both of those. The Did you reach out to Gary and, at all? Um, he had only very informally. I haven't sat down. I think our summers as Little League parents and stuff like that made it so we didn't see each other much. <laughs> and we didn't have as much free time as it feels like a summer ought to give you. <laughs> right. So does the state have a recommendation on um, how contiguous that space has to be, how large that yeah, parcel has to be? Okay. 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 So, so we need to do some research in terms of the state um, requirements, if any specifics. I, I also agree with the fact that neighborhood has to be taken into consideration because I have a colleague in Cranston, Rhode Island. She is fighting the solar overlay from their town because it's abutting their backyard. So this is going to be resistance from either side. Even the some neighborhoods may fight it too. So it has to work so for everyone. That was my earlier question. Yeah. Um, if it abuts her neighborhood, is there a risk of her property values coming down or is there something else? Property values and apparently there is other, uh, she had a list of concerns, I can gather those okay. things, but okay. there, there is a group of people who are sure. fighting it in Cranston right now, Rhode Island, so sure. I, I gather more information, but. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I think, you know, Ted's, um, Ted's ideal was that we would find places that might not affect any neighborhoods. Yes. Right. That may not be achievable, but yeah, that's that's certainly. Although the Wood Street one would be perfect, the one that I was just talking about before the meeting started, yeah. the Wood Street solar farm. Oh, there's zero Wood Street you were mentioning. Okay. It seems to be on an area nowhere near houses, an area that's already been ripped up and was used for, I don't know, a quarry <clears throat> or something or other. Yeah, I mean, stone, crushing. <laughs> stone crushing. Stone <laughs> crushing. Based on the zoning map, it looks like all the areas that are right next to the 495 highway, the Clover, all of them have been designated as agricultural zones. So maybe we have a little bit of control over what goes there. I, I, I'm just going by the map. I don't know. If yeah. yeah. That could be just um, it defaulted to green on the map. Yeah. Because that was. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe everything started as green. Like, yeah. green. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it was done. Okay. Okay, so um, looking at the specifics from the state. Hi, John. Um, and um, who owns the clover leaf land? Um, coming together for areas to suggest based on that research, then getting some planning board feedback, and um, then going into a Zach public comment and contacting property owners, you know, for those, those comments as well, and then finally drafting language and the map, you know, and that changes for a final proposal for town meeting. And um, somewhere during the process, possibly multiple times, would be um, um, involving um, Carolyn Dykema. So I think one question too that would be important to get answered is how how difficult it is it how difficult is it to lease state land? Because I imagine the road be or the space between the two sides, like 495, is obviously state land. Well, the state has a, uh, um, has a whole new, uh, it's a new and now it's about 18 months old, where they, if a town or a municipality in general has a um, higher embedded use for any state property, you petition for it and um, you can get it. That's what we're, we're working on it to try and get for the, to help with the, um, a possible location for the fire station. For one of them. So if there's something that we need, I can get the contact information. It's out of the governor's office. Okay. I guess I'd just be interested in seeing what the process is. There must be a fee associated with it, right? You buying the land, you're just taking the land? So we're talking about for a, for a solar facility. For, to for the town to use it? No. Oh, 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 if, if it's municipal, I'm saying if it's, it, it's. I'm talking about a private company. Oh, oh they do their the own land. deal. Okay, no, no, okay, that doesn't, that's not what But there meant. must be a process for that too. I don't know. Because there are, there are like in Framingham, there's a facility that appears to be on state land. Mm -hmm. On there. Well, oh, well, the Mass Pike they have, mm -hmm. there's a lot of them on the Mass Pike. Right. So 495 would probably be similar. Okay, can I ask? Who wants to take the lead on this? <laughs> the, the teaching year is in full swing right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I'm double booked with meetings yesterday. I'm double booked with meetings talk. today. I would so. be happy to talk to Gary and, and see where that takes me. Okay. And I, I would be happy to um, write some notes into an email um, to you know, like guide any of your, the research that you do. Okay. okay. Because I don't teach. <laughs> it's got me right now as college recommendations. I've got about eight college recommendations that have to be written in the next five days. I have one Monday, two Tuesday, <laughs> two Wednesday, and a Thursday next week. Speaking of college recommendations, do you actually use the brag sheets that... We don't have brag right? sheets. Oh, okay. My school, we have so few students, we know them well enough. We don't oh, okay. need brag sheets to figure out what we're supposed to write. Got it. Is that good or bad? <laughs> I think it's good. Okay, anything else on the solar farm overlay tonight? Last comments? Okay. So let's move on to accessory dwelling unit and I'll let Madhu talk through the research that she did. Yeah, I literally dumped whatever I could gather into that document, but from what I see, I'm, Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, from what I understand, the point is that uh, uh, it seems to be for accessory dwelling, there's a lot of special requests that is going to the zoning board for appeals, and we, they are trying to reduce it by trying to clean up the zoning bylaw for accessory dwelling so it can be made better. Yeah, but if you see the, if you compare it with the uh, zone, current zoning bylaw for duplex, everything needs to go to zoning board of appeals. That's how we have designed it. If I if I look, but if, the, taking a bigger picture, if I looked at other towns, there is not even like a separation between an accessory dwelling or a duplex. Anything is an attached add-on. Everything is qualified as an accessory attached to the house. So there is no distinction as a separate accessory dwelling versus duplex and stuff like that. 
So I, I, I am trying to find out, are we trying to make it cleaner or are we trying to, the purpose of it? Because the, town, the motion that was proposed to the town meeting was to just scrape the whole thing and rewrite and it got, from my understanding, it got rejected for semantics more than the whole point. It was just some line was ambiguous and they pushed back. So are we trying to scrape the whole thing and redo it or are we just cleaning it up so that no, no, not too many requests go to Zoning Board of Appeals? So, okay, this is, and I, I looked through my notes from that town meeting as well. Um, and I was also on Zach that year that we proposed this. Um, so um, my general recollection and what I see in the notes, um, is that we were trying to make it easier for the homeowner who wanted to, um, you know, m create an accessory family dwelling unit, make it easier for them and make it easier for ZBA. So not to have quite as many go through them. So trying to define what, um, <clears throat> what category could possibly be by right. Mm -hmm. The second thing that the we also had, what, 23 people on Zach that year for some reason. <laughs> and, um, and we ended up discussing a lot of very detailed particulars about, okay, if it's under, you know, a thousand and one square foot kind of thing, <laughs> this is okay, but that's not, that sort of thing. Um, so, so instead of it being a clean, okay, make these by right, make the rest still have to go through ZBA and it's gonna be a case by case situation. Um, it became much more, let's, let's, let's you know, rewrite everything, make you know, all the, the very specifics of the 800 square foot, 1,000 square foot or something like that, mm -hmm. and let's, you know, let's try to change everything. And so I think that that was the mistake, that's my opinion. Um, I still, I was going back to, you know, again, my notes from that town meeting. Um, <coughs> there were a few semantic things in here that I don't think are strongly enforced, but I think we, we wanted to clean up, such as, you know, the use limitations that can only be used by such and such, you know, a person over 60 years old. And it's like, well, well, what if the person over 60 years old is in the main part of the house and the accessory unit is for a caregiver? So, so that we would want to maybe clean up that kind of language. But then again, I don't think anybody's being refused this, this zoning based on that technicality. Mm -hmm. So even though it may be worded that way, I don't think it's enforced that way. So. Um, but then it was the mini accessory family dwelling unit that is entirely located within a singly, single family dwelling and doesn't exceed a certain square footage. Right now it says 800. I think the mini, everybody felt um, on Zach as well as at town meeting that, oh yeah, that should be just by right. Everybody should be able to you know, convert their basement into a, a, an apartment if, if they want to. And that that was generally, I believe, generally acceptable to town meeting. So if we wanted to tackle something very small, very, very s discreet <laughs> within <laughs> this huge bylaw, um, that could be one that we could do. And, you know. Or can I, I, I I'm, I'm gonna ask you a crazy question. Can we merge both of them together, accessory dwellings and duplex? Because half of the, half of the points are literally the copy between those two. And just make the special scenario, would it not? Be a good idea. Well, I think that, that might be tougher because a duplex could end up being condoized as something, con you know, and, mm -hmm. and I think that they really, uh, well, I'll, I'll defer to a professional and see what you think. Uh, but I, I, I think that they're, they're really, they're, there's a difference. Because mm -hmm. when, I, when I think of duplex, I think of the two doors, matching sides, right. you know, and they're you know, both. 12, 1,500 square feet or something. I missed the original question, what was it? No, it's about accessory family dwelling units and the way our bylaws are written.